I said, yeah. And he lit that cigarette. He gave me a cigarette. And I got to show you this. Right? I'm telling you. I put the cigarette in my mouth, and he lit a match. I'll never forget it was a wooden match. And there was no wind that morning. And the flame must have been that high on a match. And he held it here, and I couldn't light that goddamn cigarette. He says, give me that goddamn thing. He lit it and gave it back. And he says, don't throw it in the water. Too much oil and shit around there. Sat down, they took us over to the hospital ship, went up the gangplank, and they gave us coffee royal. And I remember Davenport too, just to see just he remembered. He said, I don't drink coffee. He said, give me a shot of liquor, because he's some drinker. He says, I'll take the boy uh, what bourbon or whatever it was, I don't even remember. He said, I'll take that shot. Well, I give me a shot. And I had the coffee royal. And he says, This what's gotta happen for us to get a goddamn shot of liquor off the friggin' navy? <laughs> Now, what do you want to hear? Okay. Oh, and I don't know, did you, did, did you know Stephen Young? He wrote a book. Now, uh, last I heard from him was, uh, he says, the book is completed. I use your name in the book. And uh, I hope you don't mind. I never got a chance to talk to him. I didn't give a damn whether he used my name or not. But he came to my house to uh, interview me three times. See, he was one of the guys that were trapped down there with us. Yeah. He stayed in the Navy. And in fact, he went from enlisted man right up to lieutenant and got discharged. Uh, I think he uh, put 20 in there. But uh, I says, how come you come here and keep asking me to, all these questions? He says, Mike, I got to tell you. He says, I go all over. He says, I'm in California, a different place. Because he was like discharged, but he, I don't know, he's working something. He used to sell pins for the Navy or, or must have been some sort of a salesman to sell things to different people. And he says, and I come back to you because you seem to verify everything that somebody else is telling me, and you got a good memory. I says, not that I got a good memory. I says, it's just that it's something you don't forget. I says, and if you want to be a bullshit artist, you can add to it. Nobody's going to know. I says, but if you got to live with yourself and add to it, you just don't do things like that, you know. He says, you seem to verify everything, and I'll never forget the last time he was at my house. I says, he says, I remember. When the water was rushing in and the ship was on a slant, there was one guy standing against the bulkhead, and I was the middle part, the revolving part of the turret holding on. And this guy says, I can't get over because the deck there was oil on it, slippery, and if you let go of the, what he was holding on, whatever he was holding on at the bulkhead, he would slid right down into the water. So I reached out and I says, I was telling him this, I says, here, grab my head, and when I say shove, shove yourself off the bulkhead. Okay, push. And I pulled him, but couldn't hold him with one arm. He went down like that, and he could only pull up this far because I don't care who you are, nobody's got the strength to go much further, right? So I told the guy behind me, grab my elbow here and pull back, and we got him up out of the water. And he says, yep. Yeah. He says, thank you. And I said, what do you mean, thank you? He says, I was the fucking guy on the bulkhead that you pulled over. I says, you're kidding. I don't remember whether it was you or not, right? But like I remember Davenport, uh, when I gave the word to man the ship, we had to go up through this hatch, I guess it was not about that big around from the handling room. Next, go through the shell deck, up into the uh, chamber, and then out, you know. But he was in front of me, and they get the way to ban the ship. A couple of guys went up, you know, and all of a sudden, it's a ladder. And he's going up the ladder, and he come back down like this, and he sit right on my head. Get the fuck up there, he says. He says I heard the shells break loose. You no know, sooner said that, and you could hear the shells break loose. You hear a couple of guys scream. Nobody paid attention to the scream anyway, right? And the freaking hatch was jammed down. And before you know it, the freaking water was, oh, Popeye was down in the water. And he said, so long, guys, I can't swim. Bend my foot. I said, well, pull you up, pull you up. he come up, right? And uh, uh, then the freaking ship was quiet, got quiet all of a sudden, because you ever, you see moving pictures where you see the rush of water coming in? That's how it came in. But it went over so fast that it caused an air pocket, and it stopped. As fast as it come in, it stopped. But now the figure is ever looking for the hatches. Ho, ho, hatches down here. The ship was not completely over. I think it went like, a, well, it would be 190 degrees. I would say it went over like about uh, 60 degrees or something like that because the mast guaranteed had to get stuck in the mud. In fact, I got pictures of uh, uh, the ship in a newspaper my mother had cut out where they were pulling the ship up. I got pictures in the book. 
Your Honor. I heard but, it went 150 degrees over just. How did what? 150 degrees over just short of being. I don't know. Let me put it to you this way: degrees, right? Here's the ship, mm -hmm. right? This would be zero. That would be quarter. This would be uh, what? Uh, It'd be 90. 90 degrees, right? And that would be 180. I say she went like this. She went to 90, and maybe 10 degrees more. 110 degrees that would be, yeah. then, right? Okay. Like that. Because the mass got stuck in the water. Yeah. Because I remember when we swam out, we were figuring out, we said, can't swim this way because if you swim that way, you go into the Maryland. You got to swim the other way. Now, when the ship went over like that, now we're over here. So you had to swim this way. Yeah. And I remember Roberts, well, let's find a way out. We went from, uh, we start swimming around first. I don't know, I'm telling you a story. Tell me what you want to know. Okay. You ask questions, I didn't mean to tell you this. Okay. Why'd you join the Navy over the Army or the Marines? Because I didn't like to wear ties. And I said, there's always a place to sleep and a place to eat. Oh. And they paid better at that time. When's your birthday? July the 7th. Uh, I'm sorry. July the 25th, 1922. 1922. My second birthday was July, uh, December the 7th, 1941. Mm -hmm. That's why when somebody asked me how old are you, I said, well, I was born in 41, so 41 from 89 is what? I'm only 48 years old. Uh, you went through boot camp where? Rhode Island. Rhode Island. What stations up there? What's what? What naval stations up there? Well, at that time it was a uh, naval training station, Rhode Island, that I, that's what they called it at that time. But I know, of course, they only had two, I think, what? Uh, Great Lakes, Rhode Island. I don't know if they had one on the West Coast or not. Did you request the Oklahoma? No. I requested submarine duty. Why did you get submarine duty? I took a test, but after that I heard nothing. So, when you I guess, oh. you know, they put you where you want, I guess, but where they, where they want, where they need you or whatever. When you first saw the Oklahoma, what did you think? When I first saw the Oklahoma, I said, wow, that's a big thing. <laughs> Where'd you go on board? In uh, Long Beach, California. When'd you go on board? When? Is it in the morning sometime? I mean, what, what was the date? What part of the date? No, yeah, well, no, what was the date, what year? Oh, it was uh, 1940 in October, the day I couldn't remember. It was October. Because I went, uh, I was sworn in, in uh, on the 25th, my 18th birthday, I was sworn in in New York, 25th of July, 1940. Uh, yeah, I was just 18. I was born in 22, right? 22, 24, yeah, it's 18. And uh, they, uh, they accepted me. It was like two weeks before uh, I was 18. And they said, okay, go home and we'll call you. I said, what do you mean you'll call me? I'm already in. And they said, uh, no, not yet. We'll call you, right? And sure enough, they sent me a letter to be down there. It was the day of my birthday, 18th birthday, to be sworn in down there. And then they put us on a ferry from New York to Rhode Island. When we got to Rhode Island, that's where they issued clothes. You know, do what they had to do to put you in a company to get you uh, started. We were there three months, three months training at that time. In fact, that was the first time I saw President Roosevelt. Because at our, uh, uh, one of the parades, every Saturday they had an inspection. And there every company would parade through the grounds and all that, and pass in review, and he was up at the reviewing stand. I said, oh, wow, look, President Roosevelt, right? And then uh, after that, we ended up graduating, and they give us, uh, I think it was nine days or seven days leave. I think it was nine days leave. Come back, and when we come back, they had the ship, the... Uh, 
old Ironside. It's a constellation, I guess it was. Yeah. So he said, don't want to ship and sleep. Was really, the thing was small compared to anything else, right? And uh, we strung our hammocks wherever we could, and we slept. And I think it was a day or two later, they shipped us to uh, California. We went by train to Long Beach, and then when we hit Long Beach, we went aboard the Oklahoma. So you were on the Constellation one day? Yeah, one day, I think. One, overnight it was, overnight. Mm -hmm. So you were a member of what division? 11th. It was, uh, but, uh, yeah. Left the, oh, wait a minute, wait. Uh, company, Company 11 at Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Then when I went on the Oklahoma, I was in the 4th Division. 4th Division? Yeah. What were your duties on board the Oklahoma in the 4th Division? Well, I was only an apprentice seaman. I uh, made seaman second and then seaman first. But while I was there, I was, uh, as I say, a coolie. <laughs> do deck work, you know, keep the bright white polish clean, and scrub the deck and all of that. And then I was put in the boat crew, and from the boat crew, I went on working parties and stuff like that. And from the boat crew, I went into the turret as a gunner's mate striker. But I was in there, I don't remember whether it was a month or two months, and the boats are mate in charge of the division, pulled me out and said, you got to do mess cook duty, because everybody was supposed to get three months mess cook duty. And I was doing mess cook duty at the time uh, the attack happened. Uh, I'll never forget that morning because, you know, you gotta, when you're doing mess cooking, it's not cafeteria style on those old ships of those days. You had, I don't remember, it was four pots or five pots, one fit right into the other. Not that they fit down in it, but they sat on top of each other. And you had a rack, you would go up to the galley with that and stand in line and you had, you're responsible for feeding 20 men. Sometimes you only had 18, according to way to what was left. And the tables were set up in every compartment. In other words, in our compartment, the 4th Division, the tables were shrunk from the overhead. They had uh, like U-shaped bars where you put one end of the table and that one, one end of the other, and then you would fold up the legs and they would stay there. When the time comes to set up lunch, you and the other mess cook would, because he had to feed the, I think we had, uh, two tables in our compartment, or I mean, two or three mess cooks, I don't really remember. You helped each other get the tables down, go to the scullery, get you responsible for 20 bowls, 20 knives, 20 bowls, 20 cups, 20 uh, dishes, 20 knives, spoons, and forks, all the utensils. And if any of them break, you had to pay for them. And for mess cooking, you got $5 a month more in your salary. And then when you went up to the to the galley, whatever they had to feed. You go up there and stop at each each big pot, and they would load up your, your little pots. And you put them in a rack, fill up your coffee, and if you had steaks, you had a, a flat dish, but put so many steaks in there. How many men you got? 18, 19, 20, whatever you're feeding, you put that many on it. And when you went down there to feed the men, the senior guy at your table would get whatever pot you put out first. Then he would pass it to the guy across the way and it would stagger back and forth to the end of the table. Then the other table, if you ran up, you had to, ran out of food, you had to run back up, fill the pots up again and come back down. And that's what I was doing at the time. And to eat yourself, you had to put some on the side for yourself. And half the time, somebody else would steal it on you. That morning, we had hot cakes. Every Sunday morning, we used to have hot cakes. And it was the first time nobody stole mine. That everybody was done eating, then I sat down and I ate mine. And I was in the process of washing. You had to wash your, your, all your utensils. And after you wash them, you had racks, you would take them to the scullery and it passed them through a steam table where uh, sterilized. So I was in the process. I think I had finished washing the, the dishes and the cups, and I was in the process of washing the bowls, I believe it was. And you hear this noise in the background. Oh, wow, it's going to be practice on Sunday morning. Because Sunday morning was always a, uh, what the hell did they call it? A holiday, day of leisure. You did nothing but go to church if you wanted a church goer. And you lounge around all day. If you rated liberty, you went on liberty. Whatever watch, you, if you didn't rate liberty, you stood a watch. But hearing that noise, all of a sudden, boom, the ship was hit. The ship shook. What the hell is that, right? The 
boats that are made boats are made to watch past the worried over the loudspeakers. There's no shit. Actual air raid man your battle station. I says, Wow, that guy's gonna get in trouble. My God, they're gonna court martial him for passing the word like that, right? And about that time a Marine come running down on the ladder and he says, Here comes another one, right? And bang, we were hit again. Man, you're about to I started to run and I stopped. I said, oh, my God, I've got to put all that stuff on deck because if that breaks, i got to pay for all of it. <laughs> Make a long story short, I never paid for one of it because it all went. And I went to my battle station. went to the battle station. And it was up in the turret and I was above deck, above the main deck because my station was in that last turret there, up above the main deck. Turret number four. Number four. They have four turrets on the, on the Oklahoma. <clears throat> And uh, we were hit a couple of more times. I don't remember what it was, six or seven, something like that. Uh, and uh, the vision officer up there was Rommel. And he had said, okay, everybody down below the handling room because it's safer down there. Everybody was hesitant to go, but we all went. As soon as I got down the handling room, boy, a couple of more hits, and the ship was listening. Now, the handling room was where? Oh, that's about, I'd say, according to the main deck, you know where the main deck is, right? I'd say about four to five decks below the main deck. That's where you had your magazines and you had your powder charges there that you would send up through the turret to fire the shells off with. And we no sooner got down there, and I don't think we were there. When it comes to take a time, you didn't even stop to think of that, but it was everything happened so fast. It was a matter of seconds they passed away to abandon ship. And that's when all the guys started to go up through that hatch to get out the ship. And at, at that point, like I said, where Davenport was in front of me, he come back down, and that's where the one hatch jammed shut, the shells broke loose. The ship was over so far, and that water was rushing in. All of a sudden, as fast as it rushed in, it seemed to stop. And I guess the ship was already over. And we didn't even realize it, you know, he just went with the motion of the ship. I said, oh, wow, where's the hatch? And somebody had a battle lamp. And I don't know if you've ever seen those battle lamps. They were square, about oh, 12 inches by 12 inches, and a big light up front. That was half full of water, and it was working. It was unreal. It was working. Uh, somebody turned the, uh, the battle lamp on, and they were over. By the striking down trunk there, the hatch. Somebody said, come over here with that. And he come over and look, and we were upside down. Not completely upside down, but upside down. And that's it. And, you know, everybody looked at each other and didn't know what the freak to do. And then the guy put the light out, and then somebody had a flashlight also, and a flashlight was working. Well, you don't want me to go through this whole story, do you? This year, this year takes quite a while. I mean, I'll cut out a lot of stuff. Uh, we ended up in that small trunk, and guys were all, guys, there was, must have been like 12, 13 guys, or something like that, 15 maybe. Uh, we're sitting there, and this guy shines a light on this one hatch, and there's a lock on it, right? And it said Lucky Bag, right? And the Lucky Bag is a compartment where if you left stuff laying around the ship, a thing like that. The masternons would pick it up, you know, and stow it in there, and whatever, sea bags, whatever is in there. And if you claimed it, you got extra duty for leaving your stuff laying around, because your name was on everything. I'm getting dry. Anyway, before we broke the lock to go in, on the bottom of the hatches, they had like a, not a valve, I guess you would call it a test opening. You unscrew it, see where the air was going in and out. Well, somebody just said, unscrew that thing. See, there's water on the other side of that or not. Or whether the air goes in or the air is foul or whatever, you know. So somebody unscrewed it. Nothing come out, so he said, break the lock. Break the lock open. It was dry as a bone in there. And there was pea coats and mattresses. Davenport said there was one sea bag, too. I said, I don't remember the sea bag. I said, but... We all went into that compartment. It was dry as a bone. We spread out the mattresses. Everybody laying down on the mattress, you know. And there was this one guy. Now, I don't remember his name. He was a first-class boatswain mate. He was the postmaster of the ship. He was with us. 
How the hell he got there, I don't know, because I don't remember what his station was down there or whatever. Uh, you know, at that time, you don't really remember a lot of faces because you figure, I was only in the Navy a little over a year, right? You're looking to do everything you're told so that you don't get fouled up, right? And you don't make too many friends on a ship. Your friends that you make are only in your division. And I guess I knew quite a bit of them, but since then, I sort of forgot their names. Yeah, not that I wanted her. She said, you don't have contact with them, you automatically forget. And uh, he had a dog wrench. A dog wrench is just a piece of pipe, I'd say, about 10, 12 inches long. And they would use them. There was always one by a hatch. They had a little bracket there that would stick on it. And you would use them when you closed the hatch. They had uh, one, two, three, four, five, six dogs, I think. The dogs were the latches to seal the hatch shut. When you would seal the hatch and pull them down, you'd put this on it and pull them down tighter. And the way they closed was on the door, it was like a wedge at an angle like that, so that when you close the door, the dog would close on it because that was attached to the bulkhead. And the tighter you pulled it down, the tighter it sealed the door, made everything airtight. Uh, well, that dog wrench, we were sitting in there, and his guy didn't stop tapping SOSs with that dog wrench. Like his SOS. Did 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 da 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 did did something like that. Three dots, three dashes, three dots. Uh, but anyway, even that I forgot. <laughs> but uh, and as everybody would start talking, I think it was him or somebody else. Shut up. The more you talk, the more air you're using up. So we got to use what air is in here, right? So nobody talked that much, right? Uh, I remember hearing. Somebody on the other side of the bulkhead, they tapped on the, uh, the bulkhead. And I don't remember who was talking to him. Said the guy over there said, you got a light in there. We said, yeah. The guy said, hold on to the light because it's hell in the dark. And we've been down here since it's dark. I don't, nobody knew how long we were down there. So no conception of time whatsoever. If you got that on, shut it off a minute. <laughs> Davenport, I'll never forget, he says, I gotta take a shit. I said, don't go here, go out there. We're in the handling room, right? He went out and he took a shit and he come back, he's in his pocket with all that shorts on there. He says, look at this, $6.70. What the fuck am I gonna do with this? Could be true it away, right? Nobody turned around and said, oh, we're gonna die. You know, like you see in moving pictures, guys cracking up and stuff. Nobody cracked up. That, that's a lot of baloney. Yeah. And that moving picture, Poseidon Adventure, did you see that? When I watched that picture, I see that ship going over. I said, they're in deep water. I said, no way that ship would linger so that these people could go through there and walk out and the bow still sticking out of the water. I said, that thing would have went down like a tin can with holes in it, for crying out loud. But people don't know unless they experience something like that. But anyway, uh, I don't know how long we sat around there, and Roberts, this guy was a coxswain, good swimmer he was, I remember that. Uh, he says, let's look for a way out. I said, okay, let's go. Maybe we can go out through the voids. And who knew what the hell the voids were at that time? You're so young, you don't learn the, the uh, actual structure of the ship, number of compartments and all that kind of stuff. You know, anything is a chance. You're looking for a way out. So he said, let's swim under here and come up on the other side. And we'll go over toward the carpenter shop, the tin knockers there. So we did. We swam under, come up on the other side, and uh, it was. So you got a picture. Things are inverted. Now the uh, the bottom part of the hatch, the combing. Now it was the top, but it wasn't directly uh, uh, straight up and down at an angle. You had to swim under that, and come up on. When we came up on the other side, there must have been batteries there or something because the odor was terrific. And he said, let's swim over that way. And here's where that battle lantern was. We had that battle lantern. And that thing was half full of water and still working. And we ended up in a tin knocker shop. When we swam under that hatch and come up on the other side, there was 26 guys in there. I'll never forget. I counted them. And he says, guys, find a way out? No, there's no way out here. Two guys went over there to that trunk. They went under, but they never come back. So. 
Roberts and I says, let's go over there. Maybe it's a way out. Maybe they got out, you know? So he says, you go on the first. I said, no. I got to stop cursing. No, you go on the first. It ended up, I don't remember what. He went under, I went under. But we came up on the, uh, on the other side, and the two guys were sitting on top of a hatch. He says, what are you guys doing here? Said, well, we figured we might as well use the air up here as well as out there. So why don't you go out and tell somebody? They don't know what happened to you. They told you got out. So we went back down. We told them, hey, they're still in there. And they must have had flashlights in there beside the lamp because there was a couple of lights. Now, we go over and we're sitting on piping at the bulkhead. And there's machinery hanging from the overhead, like at an angle. Like I said, this wasn't directly overhead like that. It's a hard thing to explain and to picture, I guess, because. Uh, you're listening to what I'm telling you. You never pictured anything like that, you know. But anyway, we're sitting on the piping there, and this guy Woods, see? And this is what I always said. Guarantee you didn't get out. And I didn't find out that you gave me that thing. I found his name in there. Uh, the men that perished perish that day. Uh, we're sitting on the piping, and water was coming in through the seams. And I said, wow, it's a matter of time. This place gets filled up with water, you know. Robert said, well, let's look for another way out, right? He said, we'll go back out the way we come in. I said, okay, I'm game. I know there was Roberts, me, Woods, and I don't remember who else was with us. Uh, there was like five of us that left and went into there. So I said to Woods, come on, you're coming? And he says, F it. I live my life. I don't want to say it because you got it out there. Uh, I said, what are you talking about? How old are you, Woods? I think he was from Kentucky, if I remember correctly. He's now 29. 29? As I'm only 19, and I'm looking for a way out of here. And we left. Well, the guy never got out. When you gave me that uh, thing today, his name was in there. And I guess all the guys in there must have drowned. Now, as we were swimming, uh, pretty sure there was four of us, I remember. I was like the last, and one guy in the front had the, the battle lantern. It must have been Roberts. And he was swimming. And as I come apart this one section, I see my hand sticking out of the water. Wait, wait, wait a minute, I says. And they stop. I said, come here. What's the matter? I said, look at his hand sticking out of the water. It was just, it was motionless, you know. I says, could be somebody dead or what, you know. I said, let me see. And I grabbed the hand. And as I grabbed the hand, whoosh, it went down like that. Ho, oh, oh, ho, I says, whoever it is alive, somebody on the other side of this compartment. Let's go. I swear I wanted to come up, and we were right back where we started without realizing it. Without realizing it, right? <laughs> and we got you effing guys back here again, crying out loud, using our air. Now, we never went anywhere else to look for a way out. We just accepted it, we're staying here, and that's it. You'll fall asleep, and you won't know what happened to you. But it's not that easy. You don't fall asleep. Uh, uh, and actually, if you stop thinking about it, well, like that suffocating is just like drowning. It's the same difference. Uh, your air is cut off, right? It's just that you're not swallowing water. And I guess you'd pass out to a certain extent. I didn't experience that. So I really don't know. But like I say, we're all laying out there on the mattresses. And then somebody said, Let's, how about this striking down hatch? We swim down. We can find a way out that way. And I said, yeah, providing the hatches didn't close. You know, uh, closed down on there and can't get out. Well, who's going to go down and find out? Make a long story short, who really decides. I'll go on the one condition. Everybody take off their clothes, tie it together, make a long line, and if I tug, pull back fast, right? Okay, we all ended up just in our shorts, our skivvies, because what we had on was shorts. So tied everything together, right? And I went down. Now, you didn't have to swim down because from deck to deck, you had your ladders that were welded on a bulkhead. But when you reached from the end of one ladder to the other, it wasn't a normal, I don't know, 12 inches or 14 inches apart from the next rung, because you had to reach from this rung over the deck to that one, which means it was, I'd say, 24 inches, maybe more, I don't know. But more than the regular distance between rungs. And uh, we figured out it's got to be at least three decks down 
uh, if you can clear it all the way through and it's open, and then you're down to the main deck. Because everything was open on a ship. Because we were supposed to have material ins inspection on Monday. And they were painting voids, everything. And that's why the ship went down so fast. No hatches were closed. The water tank integrity, forget about it, was nowhere near there. And then we were the first ones because we were like, you see that slip coming up? Well, let me put it this way. This way, slip coming in here, battleship row here. We were like one of the first ships where the planes were able to come down and drop the torpedoes. And we were the first ships there to get, first ship to get hit. But anyway, uh, they says, how will you know when you get to the main deck? I says, well, I counted decks, and I think it was three decks, and each deck was like about seven feet apart. So you figure seven feet apart was 21 inches, somewhere between 21 feet to 28 feet. Got to go 28 feet. I ain't going to count the feet, I said. I'll count the decks. I got to reach from one to the other because we were in what they call a coffer dam deck. It wasn't a complete deck. Now, your complete deck was the main deck, uh, uh, the second deck, and then the third deck, and that's where the compartment was, and we were below that. So you figure it was 7, 14, 21, I guess it must have been somewhere between 20, somewhere between 21 and 28 foot. I never really calculated. I don't care, I'm here, that's all that counts, right? And sure enough, I grabbed the lung and I pulled myself down, rung by rung, and I remember having to reach over, that catch is clear, reach over, and when they said, how will you know when I get there? Well, if I clear all three, I said, I'll scratch the deck. I said, it's a wood deck, and I'll come back with the pitch under my fingernails that's in between each uh, board. Sure enough, man. Turn around, boy. And pull myself back down, boy. When I come up, I was stuffed as, breathing like a stuck pig, in other ways, right? Shine a light. I says, yep, it's open all the way down. It's the pitch of the deck under my fingernails. Now, I don't know how long we sat down there figuring what you had to do, which way you had to swim. All that because of the ship going down. Who's going to go? I'll go, I says. And I went down again, but boy, I come right back. No way, I says. I ain't going to make it because you got to swim at least 50 feet out to clear the ship. And I don't know how high up. I says, I'm practically out of breath when I get down there, just enough to come back here. How the hell am I going to go another 50 feet? I'll just struggle and drown down there. No way. I'll lay down here, go to sleep, and that's the end of it. And I must have said my prayers at least four times, but I didn't say it for myself. I said it for my mother and father. I said, they're going to say this poor kid never had a chance. So let me get out and let me get killed the next day, and I don't care. That's the kind of thoughts you had at that age, because you don't think of death or uh, what, all of those things. And today, kids are the same. You stop to think about it. The crazy things that they do, you know, what do they say? What's wasted on the youth? Uh, yeah, youth is wasted on the young. Youth, the, youth, youth is wasted on the young. Right, which is true. Because I was just as crazy then. I got three sons. I got a set of twins and another boy. And I can see they're just as crazy too. But uh, it's normal life. It's, it's life. Uh, so what can you say about it, right? But anyway, to get back to what I was telling you, this one guy got in the water and he says, I'm gone. And I know he couldn't swim. I don't know whether he ever got out or not. Another guy went down, and I don't remember their names, and I heard that he ended up with a bad heart. I don't know. This is just hearsay. And then I'm pretty sure Davenport went down to come back. <laughs> it wasn't an easy thing, you know. It's, uh, you know, you stop and stop and think, hey, I got to suffer. I have to suffer. I'll lay down and go to sleep. And nobody's gonna... But you don't go to sleep, you know. And... And people say, if you're in the dark long enough, you can see there's a lot of baloney. But in order to see in the dark, there's got to be some trickle of light coming in somewhere to make you see. Because I laid there, and I put my fingers in front of my eyes like this, and I went like that. I don't know how long I did it, but I couldn't see a finger. I couldn't see a finger. I said, so that's a lot of... You find out different things, you know, that, that when you're down there. Anyway... I must have tried it two or three times, and each time I said, no way, I can't do it. And the last time I was in the water, Roberts, I'll never forget, he says, you got to go. He says, and let go of that last rung. 
You let go of that last rung, no way you can come back. Because it's dark down there and you got to go in the direction that we figured out. He says, go ahead, Mike, you go and then I'll follow. And I said, F you. You want to go, go. I tried and I can't make it. I chickened out. And I, he got in the water. He got in the water. He said, and I said, well, when are you going? I don't know how long he sit there. I says, go ahead. When are you going? Finally, he says, okay, I'm going. And he went. And, you know, you don't really have conception of time, like I say. But I says, too long. He either made it or he didn't make it. Down there too long. But, eh, the hell with it. Who knows? My back got on the mattress and laid down on the mattress, tried to go to sleep. You don't go to sleep. No two ways about it. You don't go to sleep. And you hear this, all of a sudden, you, uh, how soon after that, you hear drilling on a ship and all that. Probably those effing Japs letting the water in so we could sink further. Nobody was thinking that we were stuck. It's that shallow, you know. Or letting the water in so we can kill who's ever down here. A million thoughts going through your mind. Until we hear the two guys in the compartment that said you have light in there. Yeah, hooray, we're out. And you could hear through the bulkheads. It isn't that uh, that you can't hear through a quarter of inch of steel. It's unbelievable. Uh, and, wow, I got up, stop banging on the bulkhead. Hey, get us out, too. And the guy says, we'll get you out. Just relax, right? In the meantime, when the air getting thinner, the water started to come over the combing into the compartment. So we took a couple of pea coats and we put it over there. I figured, let the pea coats soak up. That's bold baloney, too, because that's going to soak up. It's still going to come in, right? And it was ever on the other side of the compartment. See, this is why I say, shut that off. Uh, I don't like to make a liar out of anybody. Davenport don't remember. Uh, and I remember like it was yesterday. They didn't use no settling torch on us at all because they drilled a hole through the bulkhead. And I'll get back to tell you on this, but I want to tell you this first. They drilled a hole through the bulkhead and they must have covered the hole up because whoever's there said, we're going to take some of your air out. Is it okay? Yeah, as long as you get us out too. And they started a cup with a pneumatic hammer. And I remember saying, hey, get a settling torch. And somebody said, we can't because a couple of people suffocated before we got them out. Now, it's very easy for him to misinterpret that in all these years that a couple of guys, but there's no way a couple of guys would suffocate in there if we're all there, right? Uh, and then they shift to a settling torch, so they must have tried it somewhere else. That's why they use a pneumatic hammer. Okay, that's why I say, as age, as time goes on, age passes, you, not that age, just don't remember, you know, because I know the guy, honest guy, I, I know him for the years that, I tell you, the guy got me out of a lot of fights, so he took care of me like a little brother, you might as well say. He's, I'm younger than, he's younger than I am by a few months. But anyway, is that on again? Yeah. Oh, okay. But anyway, uh, uh, after they drilled the hole through the bulkhead, they says, we're going to take some of the air out. Is it okay? And I don't know who removed me or somebody yelled, yeah, as long as you get us out too. Well, as they took their ha hand, they must have had their hand covering the hole after they drilled the hole. The water came in on us like a big wave. And not one of us was smart enough to go over and put your finger over the hole. Because if you put your finger over the hole, the water would stop. Because what's happening now, the air is going out and there's a way for the water to come in. One thing has got to be replaced before the other. Uh, well, that's simple. So right away, close the hatch. And we run over to four or five of us pushing on the hatch, couldn't get it closed. And the peacoats are there. Can't close the hatch with the peacoats are there. Open it up, get the peacoats out. Get the peacoats out, push the hatch shut. By the time we got the dogs on the hatch, and I think we only got three, maybe it was four, I don't remember. Uh, compartment was more than half full of water, but being that it was at an angle, everybody was up here, you know, up into the part where there was the driver's hole. They had jack stays going across, piping, that's what they call jack stays, holding on to them to keep you from sliding down. And they, when they started using the pneumatic hammer, they started at the hole where they drilled, cut across three sides like that. And that's when somebody said, get the settling torch, right? And they said, you can't, you get suffocated or whatever. But you heard that before. And after they got the three sides cut, I'm telling you, the water was spurting in on that hatch 
on each all sides. I look at that and says, "Wow, that freaking thing is going to blow. If that blows, it's going to hit somebody, and we're all going to drown before we get out of here." But we were fortunate because they hit the hat, they hit that opening oh, about that that much. They hit it open with a sledgehammer. And whatever there said, don't grab this to try to pull it because you can't do it. We'll hit it open. Stand back, right? Well, I was right there. I think Young was there with me. And every time he hit it with the sledgehammer and pull the sledgehammer back to hit it again, him and I would grab like that. And by the time we would grab it to try to pull it, boom, we would hit it again. So it was one of these, you know what I mean? And he finally got it open. Got it open. He says, OK, come out this way. And I was the first one out. Young and I were fighting to see who gets out first, pushing each other. And I was the first one out. But I put one foot through the hatch like this, and my hands on the part that was cut. But the deck on the other side, because cofferdam decks mean that they're not straight decks. One is lower than the other like that. I couldn't reach the other side. And I said, well, if I go down, I'm going to cut my testicles. <laughs> so I want to go back. And I'm trying to go back, and these guys are pushing me out. I finally got back in, and I went out both feet first. Both feet first, and somebody on the other side says, here, put your feet down on this box. Put my foot down on the box, and go that way. I went that way, drove whatever part, ended up in the double bottoms. As I'm crawling through the double bottoms, there was guys behind me. I could see light coming through, daylight coming through, where they cut the hole, and I stopped for a second. I don't think it, I don't even think it was a second because the guys be fine me said, "Come on, God damn it, move it, boy!" And they push me, push me out, get out on the, on the deck of, on the hull of the ship. And I think it was the gunnery officer. I could be mistaken. I don't even remember his name. He was sitting on a box, but it was an orange box or something like that. And he says, "How do you feel, son?" And I says, "Okay, fine." And we're all in our just our skivvies, oil all over us, and. Guy comes over, throws a blanket around me, and I says, what time is it? He says, nine o'clock. I says, shit, we only been down there an hour. He says, bullshit. He says, this is Monday morning. That's why I know it was 24, 25 hours. And I looked around, I said, wow, this war is lost. Right? So he takes me down to the motor launch. I get in the motor launch. He says, you want a cigarette? And I said, yeah. And like, like I told you before, no use going through it again, I lit that yeah, I put that cigarette in my mouth, and the match he lit was that, flame was that high on it, there was no wind. And I was shaking so much I couldn't light it. So he lit it for me, and then they took me over to the hospital ship, examined, examined us, gave us a shot of liquor and coffee, coffee royal. That was it. Next day they sent us over to the receiver station, and uh, they were putting guys on different ships, you know, to get out there, and uh, I'll never forget. We were out there, lined up, and they were calling off uh, numbers of destroyers. They needed so many men, right? They were, putting, they were stacking up, let's face it, they were overloading every ship. So I said to this friend of mine, don't step out for the destroyer unless it's a 400 number. They're the biggest, they're the old newest, right? Well, about the time they called the 400 number, they sounded an air raid uh, siren, and the uh, air raid is eminent. Woo, everybody scattered. It was over in and out. It was just false alarm is what it was. Everybody was trigger happy at that time. So when it was over, we go back. What the hell are we doing now? We go over to the receiver station. Oh, you guys just sit around. We'll call your names. And they finally called our names and go over to the Honolulu. And we had to find out where she was and walk over there. And when we went over there, they didn't believe us who we were. They had to call back to the receiver station because one guy had a I guess he had it like no records. It had to be just a sheet of paper with our names on it. And the, the officer on the quarter deck he ain't going to believe this stuff because everybody's skeptical now. Who's a spy or whatever, you know? Because I guess there was a lot around there at that time. They brought us up into the, the mess hall, uh, the, uh, up in the galley. Stayed up there. There was a couple of Marines there, I guess, watching us because one guy had on an aviator's jacket, dungarees, and a few of us that got off the. Uh, uh, with uh, the solars, with clean clothes, were the only ones that were clean, except for what oil we couldn't wash off yet. And we stayed there until he verified with the receiving station that we were sent over to the Honolulu, right? And they gave us sandwiches or something, and they said, look for a place to sleep. 
and now the ship was in dry dock already because we had spent one day on the Solus before we went over to the receiving station. In the meantime, the Honolulu, a bomb had gone through the dock, I think she was at Pier 14 or something like that, and exploded in the water and dented the bow where our magazines were so they had to unload the ammunition. And uh, uh, she wasn't in dry dock. No, she was still at the dock. She was still at the dock. She didn't go to dry dock. Uh, I went aboard her, then she went into the uh, dry dock uh, for repairs before we can go back to the States. We unloaded the ammunition first. Uh, after we unloaded the ammunition, then we went in the dry dock. We were sleeping anywhere, right, till they assigned us to a division. And I'll never forget, she's in dry dock. I'm laying on a deck with a blanket. Some guy gave me a blanket. And it's here, the sirens go off, and general alarm, air raid is imminent. Man, I run out on deck, across, across the gangplank, out, oh, out of the dry dock. I said, where you going? I said, I'd be a son of a bitch. I ain't going down with another ship. <laughs> I was caught once, they ain't going to catch me again. <laughs> but uh, it was a false alarm. And we unloaded all the ammunition on that ship. They repaired the bow. We went back to San Diego and reloaded ammunition. When we left San Diego, we went right to Australia. And that, that I'll never forget too, right? When they say, uh, they just have all these slogans out uh, about don't talk, because... Uh, loose lips sink loose, ships. That's it, loose lips sink ships. Sink ships, right? <coughs> I met a girl on the beach, on the beach. The beach is when you're on shore, on Liberty. Uh, one kid said to me, where's this beach? We're always looking for a beach. I said, what are you kidding me, where's the beach? He said, the beach is the shore. He said, I look for a place to go swimming, the beach. No way, I said. When we mention we're going on the beach, we're going to shore. <laughs> and when I met her, I said, well, we're leaving tomorrow, I know. We've got to be back at the ship. She says, oh. I said, I don't know where we're going. So I don't know where we'll be back in San Francisco. She said, you're going to Australia. I said, how the hell do you know we're going to Australia? We know you're going to Australia. I figured, hey, what does she know bullshit? Well, you wouldn't believe she was right. And they didn't tell us until we were out to sea for a couple of days. We met a couple of transports. We ended up taking 16 transports, and there was two, uh, two destroyers and us, one cruiser, all the way to Australia. And we dropped so many of them off at New Caledonia, and the rest off at Australia. We had four days' liberty in Australia, and then back to the States. I'm going to tell you the whole thing. When did you go aboard the Alabama? I went aboard the Alabama. I was on the uh, Honolulu, I guess about 11 months, I would say. It was sometime in October or November, because I went aboard her December 8th, 9th, 9th or 10th, whatever, uh, after the attack. And from there we went to Australia, back from Australia, uh, uh, and we were heading on uh, up to Alaska from Hawaii. And on the way up is when the Midway battle broke out. And they called us back down and go to Midway. And we were like, oh, got about a day out of Midway because we were already on our way up to Alaska. And we get a day out of Midway and they says, okay, turn around and go back because everything is under control. So we didn't actually participate in the Midway battle. And we went back up to Alaska. We were up there to bombard the Kiska, the Rat, uh, no, not Kiska, uh, the Rat Islands or something up there. Because yeah, Kiska, yeah, it must have been Kiska Illusion because we used to be based in Kodiak. We'd be out to sea. If I remember, there was a San Francisco, uh, the Honolulu, I think the Raleigh, Indianapolis, a bunch of destroyers. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe, but I remember the San Francisco being there because I had a friend of mine that was on that ship. Went to a boot camp together. In fact, when I, I went over to see him, we both happened to be aboard at the same time. He saw me walking up the deck. Holy shit, he says, I thought you were dead. No way, I says, you don't get rid of a bad penny that easy. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, then I got transferred off of her, I think it was in November of uh, 42. So I ended up going on in Denver. And while I was on in Denver, Philadelphia, I went home on... Uh, overnight pass, got drunk, missed the ship, and she went out, thrown in the brig. There they got a summary court martial, and they sent me on to the Alabama. And I had to go up to Portland, Maine to catch us. 
and there was me and this guy Smitty that missed the ship. I left all the other guys that were transported from the Honolulu to the Denver with me, like Davenport, uh, those guys went on in Denver, Popeye, Scott, whatever. Uh, I don't remember uh, all that went on in Denver. And like I say, I missed the ship, and there was only two of us that ended up on the uh, Alabama. And uh, I stayed on her from, she was just put, she was put in commission before I went on her. She was on a shakedown cruise. Then we went up to the North Atlantic for eight months. We operated with the English fleet. And I guess it was the end of 43, we went out to the Pacific. And we were out there right to the end of the war. They signed a peace treaty in uh, Japan. How would you compare the Alabama to the Oklahoma? Oh, much uh, bigger ship, faster, uh, better living because it was cafeteria style, uh, not the old style uh, mess cooking. It was a cafeteria style mess cooking. What about the crew? The crew? Well, you see, I knew more of the crew on the Alabama because I was on her so long than I did on the Oklahoma. On the Oklahoma, I was more confined to the 4th Division. You know, I didn't get around, but on the Alabama, I ended up making a rate, and I was a boatswain mate, and the majority of boats and mates get known throughout the ship because they stand they stand watches on the bridge, pass the word, and handle anchor detail, you know, tying up the ship and all that kind of, and you get more or less known. But while I was on that ship, we got a commander aboard ship, and I'll never forget his name, Commander Bailey, a new executive officer. When he come aboard, I, I thought nothing of it. I was on the quarter deck piping him aboard. And as he come aboard, he turned around and said, what the hell are you doing here, he says. 